you pray with me? Father, how good it is to be in your house this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather, to worship, uh, knowing that when we gather here in your name, you gather with us. And so we pray your spirit would fill us this day, Lord, that you would bless our worship, our hearing of your word, and all that we do, that we might go from this place better able to be your people in a world desperate to know you and to know the good news of who you are and what you have done for us. So bless us in this time. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Would you take a minute and greet one another as we gather in worship this morning? Let me also say a word of welcome and good morning. It is good to see you this morning, good to have you with us in worship. We are glad that you're here. Do ask one thing of you um, in a moment as our pew pads go through. If you will sign in, whether you're visiting with us, whether you're here every Sunday, if you will sign up so that we can have record of you being here, that, that helps us know what's going on, that helps us get information to you about what is happening in the life of the church. You have opportunities to sign up for different things coming up as well. So if you would pass those, pass those along as we continue in worship, sign up for them or sign up on them so that we can have record of you being with us this morning. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see lots of things going up. The big one coming next Sunday is Promotion Sunday, and it as is our Custom Promotion Sunday comes with a lot of elements. Um, it begins with a donut fellowship starting at 845 in the rotunda. There will be donuts available. First time in two, three years, something, three years we'll have our donut fellowship. So return of the donut fellowship. Hope you'll be there for that n next Sunday morning. Um, and then our children especially will promote to their new Sunday school classes. So You'll see information about that, and Elizabeth will be getting it out, I'm sure. But everyone will begin in their normal Sunday school class next week, and then they will move to their new one. Um, rising sixth graders will come down to the youth. Um, all of that will happen next week. And then we'll have our blessing of the backpacks during worship. Um, now, I understand that a lot of backpacks look the same this year due to some changes in the district policy. Um, so... Think about that when you bring your black backpack up to place it at the front. Um, maybe stick something on there, do something to make sure that you know where your backpack is because I'm looking for the clear one. Probably isn't going to help you out when there are 85 of them sitting up here next week. So keep that in mind as we, for our blessing of the backpacks. I hope you will be here. It'll be an exciting, it's a good day as we, as we recognize a new Sunday school year, as we um, pray for the school year that will have begun at that point but is, but is ongoing and you'll see we'll also celebrate new life for those who are going into the waters of baptism so it's going to be a special day of worship next week you can also see the schedule with, with promotion Sunday starting we're getting close to everything taking off so our fall programming you can see that schedule different opportunities for ministries make sure you take opportunity to look at that um, children and youth both have end of school pool parties this afternoon and evening. Um, children at 5, youth at 5.30, that information is in your bulletin. So it's a, a busy day that begins a busy time, but it is a good day because we are gathered here for worship. And so if you haven't yet, I ask that, ask that you'll pass the pew pads as our choir leads us in worship.
Would you pray with me? Lord, again, it is good to gather in your house this morning. God, to come, to come into this place and see the table prepared for us. To be reminded of the body broken and the blood shed on our behalf. That we might know you fully. And that we might be reconciled to you. Lord, we come this day, many of us with hearts heavy and minds burdened with events of the past week or with anticipation of what's to come. Lord, may we lay those things at your feet in this time, knowing that you are the one who can, that you are the one who can carry our burdens and who can take on our grief and our pain. Lord, we pray for those all of our teachers and students and administrators, those preparing for the start of school this week. Lord, we pray for your safety. We pray for your protection on them as they go back. We, Lord, we pray for, for courage as many of them go into new situations. We pray for peace with all that, that goes on in the buildup. And God, most, most of all, we pray for your boldness, Lord, that as all of our students and teachers and administrators go into a new year, they go into a year focused on being your servants in the places that they go, of showing your love, and of bringing it to, to so many in our community who need to know it. So we pray for them this day. We pray for all of us and for anything that we're facing, knowing that you are the one who can guide our steps. And so we pray that you'll guide us in all that we do, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. It's time. I, ooh, I would like to invite all of our children to join me at the front for our children's sermon. Good morning. Well, the time has finally come. What's happening this week? We're heading back to school. Your teachers have been working so hard preparing their classrooms for you to join them this week. And I know that they can't wait for you to arrive. I brought with me today one item that you must always have on hand and ready to learn at school. What do I have? A pencil, that's right. So I'm gonna take this pencil and I am going to write my name on this piece of paper. Wait a minute. It's not doing anything. What? Thank you, Porter. It's not sharpened. There's no point on my pencil. So what do you think we need to do? We got to sharpen it. We can use an electric sharpener. We could use an held hand sharpener. Maybe you've even seen those old-timey crank-style sharpeners. I saw some at Lawrence Middle School last week when I was there, so they still exist. Yep, so once we have a nice sharp point on our pencil, we can use this pencil for all kinds of things. We can write, we can draw, we can fill in bubbles when we're taking a test. We can use a pencil for all kinds of things. Did you know that our lives can sort of be like a pencil? God wants to use us in all sorts of wonderful ways to serve him and his people. 
But we must first be sharpened in order to do this. So how in the world do we sharpen ourselves? Well, most importantly, we can sharpen ourselves by reading Scripture and praying. In Proverbs 27, verse 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Once we develop our faith and trust in God, then he can use us to do some really, really cool things. It would be so silly to sharpen a pencil and set it to the side. But when we use it, the purpose of the lead is fulfilled. Let's take another look at this pencil. And I'm even going to grab one out of here because this one has a nice point on it. Now, once it's sharpened, will it always stay that way? No, the, the point is dull after we use it a lot. Sometimes it breaks or the tip just falls off. We need to continue to sharpen our pencil in order to keep using it. In the same way, we must continually return to the Bible and prayer so that we can remain sharp as Christians we keep close to God by loving him and communicating through him, reading his word and talking to him in prayer. And we also love his children. Jesus tells us in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Christ promises that God will keep us close if we remain near to him. When we do this, we can rest assured that we will stay sharp. Because without God, life is like an unsharpened pencil. It just has no point. Will you pray with me? God, our lives are much like a pencil. We ask for your guidance and help as we begin a new school year. And when our lives are extra busy with all of the many things happening around us, that we would continue to sharpen ourselves daily by reading your word and through prayer. I pray that these children, their teachers and administrators will remember to begin this new year sharpened and eager to be a light to those all around. In your name we pray. Amen. Before you go, I have a pencil with a nice sharp point for you all to get. And then our four and five-year-olds may leave and go to extended session.
dear Heavenly Father, the body of your Savior, Jesus Christ, torn for us as we eat, help us remember. The wounds that heal, the death that brings us life, paid the price to make us one. Help us remember today. Help us to remember as we give. Help us to give abundantly so that more may come to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. So good to see you all in God's house this morning. And um, if some of you were anticipating someone else preaching this morning, I apologize. Um, Tim won't be here until the 1st of September. Um, his first sermon will be September the 11th. If you invited a friend today to come hear him, I apologize. Uh, he'll be here September the 11th. But it's good to be here and have the opportunity to come and to share with you today. Our passage today is found in Luke 22. And today I'll be reading verses 14 through 23. And so please join me as I read. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who was going to betray me is with me at the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the one who betrays him. 
they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Also a dispute arose among them as to which one of them was considered to be the greatest. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've had a lot of people ask me this morning about my sermon title, um, Scrambled Eggs. And I know that you're probably thinking like, oh, geez, man. But I've had a lot of people this morning who have asked me if I'm actually cooking breakfast this morning. And I told them that they do not want me to cook anything because when I cook, roaches hang themselves. It's that bad. I cannot cook. But I'll tell you where that title comes from. Has anyone ever heard of a small, um, obscure rock band from Liverpool, England, known as the Beatles? Anybody ever heard of the Beatles before? Okay, just a handful of people, okay. Where have y'all been for like the last 50 years? But the Beatles were this band that really revolutionized rock and roll music in this century. Paul McCartney was the bassist in the band and one of the lead singers. And there's a story that Paul McCartney woke up early one morning with the melody of a song playing in his head. And this melody was so, came to him so easily and was so beautiful that Paul thought that he had actually heard this somewhere else and that he was just kind of plagiarizing it. And so he played it for his bandmates. He played it for friends, for countless people. There are probably 2,000 people who heard this song. Everyone that he played it for said, No, I've never heard that song, but it sure is beautiful. And so knowing now that he had not plagiarized this melody, he began to set working lyrics to this song so that he would not forget the melody. They framed, in a way, the melody of the song. And the lyrics set a framework for the melody, and McCartney entitled the song, Scrambled Eggs. It took him almost a year to come to the lyrics so he could finish this song that had been driving him nuts and also his bandmates nuts because everywhere they went, they played that song, Scrambled Eggs, among each other. The working title, Scrambled Eggs, as I've already said, set the framework for the melody. And that song will become one of their most famous hits, Yesterday. The song Yesterday began as Scrambled Eggs. Paul McCartney had used that working title so that he may one day finish this song and that he would not forget the melody that he had had awakened with that particular morning. Like scrambled eggs, the first Lord's Supper was Jesus' way to give his disciples, past and present, a framework to remember all that he has done for them and for us. And this framework still extends to us today. In the passage today, Jesus is saying, do this and you will remember me. You see, Jesus knew how easily the human mind forgets. The Greeks had an adjective which they used to describe time, and they described time as time is that which wipes out all things. They are saying this as if the mind of man were this blackboard or piece of slate, and the mind is a sponge, and time is a sponge that wipes that slate clean. Jesus is saying that in the press of things, 
you will forget me. He's telling his disciples, come together at times to the peace and the stillness of my house and do this again with my people and then you will remember. Communion did not originate in the heart and mind of man, rather it originated in the heart and mind of Christ. And he did this so that we would remember what he has done for us. Because communion is a time to remember. To help the disciples remember, Jesus used two very common symbols and gave them new meaning. In the scripture today, Jesus said of the bread, this is my body. This is what we mean by sacrament. A sacrament is something usually a very ordinary thing which has acquired a meaning beyond itself for him who has eyes to see and a heart to understand. Now, to give you an illustration of that, how many of you somewhere in your house has a junk drawer? Okay. The junk drawer people outnumber the Beatles people for some reason. But in the dresser in my bedroom, I have a uh, junk drawer. (laughs) I'm sorry, if you're visiting, please come back. This is a great place. A junk drawer. And in this drawer, there are things that most people would look as as junk. Why aren't you getting rid of this? There are cards from family members from birthdays and Father's Days and Christmas all the way back for years and years. There is a case that holds a set of uh, Hot Wheels Redline cars that I used to play with as a child. There are notes, there are trinkets, there are things from my past. And I may say to myself one day, you know, I need to go into this drawer and throw these things out. But every time I handle them, every time that I see them, it reminds me of my past. And those things become more important to me than cleaning that drawer out. That is a sacrament. The bread which we share during communion is common. But for the one who has a heart to feel and understand, it is the very body of Christ who took on our sins and sacrificed his life for us so that we might have abundant life. But then Jesus said of the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. In the Bible, a covenant is a relationship between man and God. God had graciously approached the Israelites way back in Exodus chapter 24. He approached the Israelites and they promised to obey and keep God's law. And the continuance of that covenant depended on the Israelites keeping this pledge and obeying that law. They could not do it. And we still cannot do it. Our sin interrupts our relationship with God. And in the Jewish sacrificial system, That was designed to restore that relationship between man and God through a sacrifice, the offering of a sacrifice to God. Jesus was the complete and ultimate sacrifice for our sins. By Jesus' life and death, for those who have placed their faith and their trust in Christ, we have been restored into a relationship with God and adopted into His family. We were drowning, and we could not save ourselves, and we needed a Savior. 
But God didn't send us a book on how to swim. He sent us a Savior so that we might be saved. And as we remember, we can also reflect. Communion offers us the opportunity to reflect on how we don't deserve what Jesus did for us. But you know, Jesus already knew that, and he did it anyway. Communion offers us the opportunity to reflect on how we don't always give Jesus the honor and the priority of our lives that he deserves. But he still loves us anyway, and he still pursues us. Communion leads us to reflect on how God's love is beyond our comprehension. But that didn't stop God from showing it to us and by sending Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. Communion reminds us that God wants to be a part of our everyday lives, of all of that everyday life, that God wants to be a part of that. And Jesus invites us to the communion table to remember and reflect. But we cannot just stay seated at the table and remember and reflect. Because communion is also a time to respond. In 2004, I was able to take my dad to the Masters at Augusta National, something that we did together a lot. And this was a very special Masters because this was to be Arnold Palmer's last Masters. I grew up knowing everything in the world about Arnold Palmer because every Sunday, the te- Sunday afternoon, let me clarify that, Sunday afternoon when I was a kid, Dad would be in there watching golf, and he would always wait for Palmer to come across the screen. And so this was a special treat, that this would be the last time that Palmer would walk the hollow grounds of Augusta National as a competitor. We kind of followed Palmer for a while. We got kind of separated because I wanted to go find someone else, so we quit following Palmer. We went over and watched someone else play, some, some guy named Tiger or something. Uh, we went and watched him for a while. And we made our way back to number 13. There were clouds rolling in. There was thunder and lightning off in the distance. And Arnold Palmer was teeing off on number 13, and we were on the right-hand side of hole number 13. Palmer hit his drive directly in front of us. We're like, wow, we're going to get to see him up close. But right as he got to his ball, they fired the horn and suspended play for the rest of that day. And what they do in those times is that the golfers will go and mark their ball with a tee or something like that, they'll mark the ball so when they come back later or come back even the next day, there will be something that is marking that ball. And so Palmer came up, stuck a tee in the ground, picks his ball up, and he begins to literally walk directly towards us. Now this is an emotional time. This is his final masters. There are people that are cheering, they're just you know, kind of going nuts that he's coming towards them and he's, you know, kind of patting people on the back and he walked up to my dad. <clears throat> he walked up to my dad and said, how you doing, young guy? With everything that Arnold Palmer had going on in his head and his heart that day, He took the time to speak and to pat my dad on the shoulder and give him a word of encouragement. That was the last Masters that Palmer played in. It was also the last one that my dad was able to attend.
And I think about the passage that I just read when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. I've always just totally assumed that that was just the elements, the bread and the cup that he shared. But I think there's something more here in this passage. Because as Jesus was saying this, he was teaching them, he was serving them, and he was loving those disciples. With all that he had, that he was going to endure for us, he still did this for them and for us. And even the one who would later betray Jesus had been invited to that same table. And he loved him too. To remember in this context is not just a mental exercise. Rather, it also involves a response. 1 John 4.10 says, This is love, not that we love God, but that He first loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. Because of what Christ has done for us, we have a debt of love that we can never repay. Remembrance is also about loving each other. The response is to love each other. We accept the other person because Christ first accepted us. We forgive the other person because He first forgave us. We are patient with others because He has been so patient with us. We are generous with others because He has been so generous to us. See, how He's loved us is the way that we are called to love each other. And when we love each other in that way, we remember what Christ has done for us. And so today, we come together as a family of faith to gather around a table that Christ has set for us. It is a table that is set with unconditional love, with mercy and grace and forgiveness. And so often in our lives, we say we invited Christ into our hearts, but really the reality of that is that He has invited us into His, particularly at the communion table. And so as the deacons come forward to serve the elements, I would like to ask that you take just a few moments as they are hand, uh, distributing that, that you would just pause and remember what Christ has done for you. That you re reflect on the difference that knowing Christ has made in your life. You're invited to the table. Now come.
you take a moment and open your communion package this morning? Got to be an engineer to do some of these. So. On the evening that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples together in an upper room and they shared in a meal. And in that meal, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and then he blessed it. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, for the gift of your Son, we give thanks. Father, today we remember what you have done for us that through your sacrifice, through a body that was broken by the weight of the sin, of this world. Father, you have saved us. You have brought us back into your presence and through your, your death we have gained the abundant life that you have always promised us. Let us always remember that and carry that in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Jesus said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And likewise, Jesus took the cup, and as he did that, he blessed it. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, today we are reminded, as we hold this cup, that Father, it is only the blood of your Son that cleanses us from all of our sins. And Father, from that, we have been forgiven, we have received mercy, we have receive grace so that we might once again be in a relationship with you. Father Christ has paid this price for us. And now he is the way and the truth and the life, the only way that we can come to you. And so, Father, help us today to remember that sacrifice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Jesus said, take, drink. This is my blood which was shed for you. At the end of my talk today, I mentioned about how communion is about a response. As we come to this portion of our service, we have an opportunity to respond in whatever way that you feel God leading you to respond. Some of you may want to recommit your lives, that you may, uh, God has revealed something to you today and that you want to get back connected with Him through Christ. Maybe today you want to do something more tangible. Maybe today you have never uh, responded to Christ and that you have never accepted Him and asked Him to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you're simply looking for a church home, a community where we come and remember together. But whatever your decision is today, I pray that you would respond to how God has called you as we sing our hymn of invitation.
Okay, you may be seated. I got a few people today that I want to introduce to you. Um, we have three people who are coming today uh, to join in this church. First is Linda Holly. This is Linda Holly. Linda has been coming here for quite some time, and she has been visiting with our church for some time and has gotten involved in Sunday school, I believe the Bobby Smith class, yes. and uh, has really connected in there, and now she wants to come today and, and join in in this community, this family of faith, uh, so that she might remember and grow. If you support this decision, of Linda's this morning, would you let it be known by saying amen? amen. Just our way of saying we are here for you. And uh, if you want to stand here for just a second, come on up. It's Braden Yarborough. Braden comes today on profession of faith uh, and wanting to make Jesus his Lord and Savior and wants to follow him through the waters of baptism. He comes today. Um, Making that decision has been something that I know Andrew has been discussing with him uh, for a while, and today he comes to make this decision. If you support Braden's decision here this morning, would you let it be known by saying amen? amen. Our way of saying we're here for you, Braden, okay? Look forward to that. Scott? <clears throat> this person should be no... This person should be no stranger either. This is Scott O'Rear. Scott uh, basically grew up at this church. He was in my youth ministry when I was here a long, long time ago. Um, and he is coming today to rejoin this church after moving to another church. So he comes today on promise of letter, uh, as Linda does as well. Uh, but he comes today to rejoin our church and to join back in this community. If you support this decision, would you let it be known by amen? amen? Scott, welcome back. It's good to have you. Any family members that we have or anything that come? I know uh, John and Brooke, if y'all want to come up and stand with Braden and Jack, if you're here, uh, you can come and stand with, with them. Uh, they're going to be down front uh, following our service today. And what I want you to do is I want you to come down and I want you to welcome these three in to our community of faith. We are so happy to have all three of you coming down and making decisions today. It's been a great day of worship. Go out and remember. It has been a blessing to share in communion with you this morning. And as we begin to close our time, would you please stand and receive the benediction. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together where we can come and share and remember in a time of communion. Father, your word promises us that one day we will share this meal all together in your house and in your presence. But Father, as we await that glorious day, Father, help us to simply remember in the days that we are here. Father, let us be reflections of you in this world. And Father, help us to live and to love in such a way that would always point others to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.